There we go. No. Mike, you're on. Action. Yep. Very good. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers, boys. Yeah, we had a false start, so That's all right. there we go. That's why our beers are already open. New <laughs> stuff. We yeah. have new microphones we were just talking about. And uh, w what I was saying when I looked over and noticed that not all the channels were armed for recording as we they are now, and I just double-checked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're being super hyper-vigilant yeah, about it. Yeah, <laughs> I really am. Uh, what what sold me on these, they're, they're not the most expensive mics in the world, but I needed three of them. And I have a KSM 32, which is amazing, but, you know, they're 600 bucks a pop. Right. Uh, a comparison between the two. They were fantastic. But a bunch of old pony ponytail guys said these are great because uh, if you use these on the stage or recording studios in – crappy places where people steal your stuff they said these are great because you can get them cheap yeah. and then i bought refurbs off of amazon normally i don't do that but all the all the bad reviews were just they were from somebody that was too stupid to have bought it in the first place yeah exactly right so somebody who doesn't know how it works doesn't know it's a condenser mic blah 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 right you know? and it, it didn't happen you know they 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 get a condenser mic and they go well it doesn't come with a cord and so they don't know how to plug it into a computer and it's or they thought it was a USB mic. Hey. Like, no, that's not how it works. So we, we take advantage of the ignorant when it comes to technology stuff. Yeah. You know, via bargains when available. <laughs> so yeah. these are perfect. And, and Nicole said you guys need to get, you know, those those kind of mics that the big boys use because you can see your faces. And I'm like, the, the people I hang out with, no. we really shouldn't. We d you don't do need that. to see our faces. Yeah. I'm yeah. surprised you even do a, a video version of this. You know, whenever I do my podcast, even on on my YouTube channel, it's just audio. Yeah. It, it, I, I have, I have animated VU monitor with the logo and a little antenna, a little radio tower that's emitting just, you know, imaginary radio waves yeah. just for something to look at if you want to. But I'm just an ugly dude, man. I appear on camera way too much on my YouTube channel as it I'm, is. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, both, both, uh, lines of my family can be traced right back to England and, and I can't remember what movie quote it was, but it says, ah, the English, they're, they're an unfortunate looking people. So, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, we did the arms, we did all that. So everybody can get kind of comfortable, yeah. open the cameras out. Hopefully it'll look good. Well, these, and, so, these sound great. And yeah. I'm, I'm, as I was saying earlier, I'm really happy that I can now sl slouch like a slob as I do in most other areas. Yeah, of it, life. This is the, very comfortable. I'm, I'm a little, I, my wife, my wife and I set it all up and we, tested the camera angles and I have to drink left-handed which isn't cool because I spill right-handed all the time and I have so. to drink right-handed which is yeah, oddball for me to, too but I just have to drink we'll normal. see yeah we'll, we'll have to switch it up sometime yeah yeah well I'll, yeah. I'll move over there and see how it works but <laughs> yeah, yeah it's it's pretty cool but no I'm, I'm happy with it sounds good decent mics yeah. and awesome and you can move them around and totally awesome. fantastic no I uh, your your uh podcast type episodes you don't need it. Uh, these, since these are kind of long form conversation yeah, things and we show pictures and, right. and all that, yeah, I think right. it's, you know, it, it's a little something, which brings me to something I wanted to talk about. And I shared it with you guys. We, we had a little, little, uh, I guess, Facebook messenger conversation about it. You can take the YouTube stats and the Buzzsprout, the audio only stats, Mm -hmm. And they are inversely proportional. Right. So mm -hmm. something that will get 300 views on YouTube will get very few on Buzzsprout. Like I have episodes with less than 100 views on YouTube that have 800 views right. in Buzzsprout. And, and that's yeah. you can you can blame that squarely on YouTube. You, yeah. YouTube is now actively and very aggressively oppressing smaller channels. If uh, they've got a certain amount of advertisers and advertising dollars and they're putting it in to genres and onto channels that they really feel like they're giving their customers the best bang for their advertising buck. And in the process, what they're doing is they are actively. Well, th this is all speculation on my part because they don't share anything, but this is what I think is happening. They're actively unsuggesting and deprioritizing anything outside of that because it's taking up bandwidth. It's taking up traffic time. It's, and they're trying to direct the average YouTube viewer toward the things that they want you to watch that has the best, highest dollar yeah. CPM advertising on it. So little channels are getting squeezed out. If you've been looking at my channel, which has almost 11,000 
subscribers. It's being squeezed out. I've got everybody telling me, why am I not getting notifications for your channel? I've got the bell. I've got the subscribe button. Why is this happening? Well, YouTube's doing it. YouTube yeah. doesn't want you watching my videos. They want you watching you know the the history the, guy the, the, they want you watching well, PewDiePie yeah. or they want you watching yeah. well they don't even really like PewDiePie but mm -hmm. they can't stop him he's too big he's become a juggernaut but they want you watching guys like Shane whatever they want you watching like the gay dudes and they want you watching the guy who wears makeup and they want you watching they they, they are just, they are great being very deliberate in how they're directing traffic on the website well and, and here's why I think you're right I'm going to lean back and move my mm -hmm. microphone just because I can. How about that? That's sweet. Oh, yeah. So uh, while I was gone last week, I did very little YouTube, and it wasn't until today, and I was cleaning house and putting stuff up and organizing and looked at my feed, and I knew you had released a video because I missed the ride. You did a yeah. uh, we the, rode the ride to Lake Thomas. It right? was an epic day. We took the ride, and I got home, and I edited all night and got it up today. The only reason I knew that video was out was I saw your post on Facebook. Right. And uh, I had to dig for it. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I watch, you know, the, a couple of the big pod, podcasters and I get into the history guy and forgotten weapons and those kind of dudes. And it was buried behind all that. And it was easier to find suggested stuff off of that than it was to look for you. Right. And so I, I, and I in a way I get it. But like I said in the update about this podcast, this is a local thing. I'm not. I'm not out to compete with anybody. I'm not trying to get huge. I don't want to get monetized. I want to just, uh, this is a, yeah. but it yeah. still sucks that, you know, YouTube is actively, the, yeah. they're actively shadow banning it for lack of a better word, the channel when you're getting up to 10 to 15 times more downloads and listens on a different platform, yeah. you know, when that happens, you know, it's YouTube doing right. it. Yeah. And, and it was, yeah. it was funny. I, I, I had a, one of those, uh, chemo steroid infused, uh, super meticulous uh, math moods and I've figured out that this has roughly the viewership of those 5 a.m. local uh, TV show things, right? <laughs> yeah. Good good morning, uh, good, yeah. good morning, podunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. where they dragging the guy, they just got him out of bed and he's all hung over to talk about the car show coming up next weekend or you know, whatever. So it's about like that. Community and, television. Yeah, and, and that's and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. It's kind of where I want to stay. It's what I wanted to do, yeah. sort of do our thing. Uh, which reminds me, uh, the Burr Williams thing was fantastic. It's yep. I've we gotten a gotta lot of compliments. Have him back. He is coming back. Even if I don't get to be a part of the next one, I still want him back. So I have um, I have it to listen. Before to. we get too far off topic, I do want to throw my two cents in about the YouTube and, and sure. You know, YouTube is is doing terrible things right now. They are you know the worst at everything, and they yep. should be ashamed of themselves. And if they want to do anything about it, they can come attack my channel. It's Tim Kreitz Adventures. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's so. right. Yeah, they're already there, yeah. man. Yeah, they're, they're already there. I, Almost 11,000 subscribers, and I'm struggling to get 1,000 views man. in a video. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, and, and, uh, and Mike, what you're doing uh, with Apple Cider Club, mm -hmm. I have to look for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in terms of how much I watch, I watch as much of two of my closest friends as, you know, the big channels I've never watched before. Or I've never met before, you know, and I, yeah. and I see those guys and mm -hmm. I still have to dig for your stuff. Yeah. And it, it just, I have uh, I found that the way that I always get Mike's videos and the way that I always get the van cave is that I go to my desktop computer in the studio yep. and I log in on, you know, in a regular web browser and I go to my subscription feed. Yes. Because the one thing that thankfully they haven't suppressed yet is the actual subscription feed. Mm -hmm. Right. As right. far as I know, because I always see Van Cave, I always see Apple Cider Club, the, the year was, all that stuff. If you watch it on Roku, it will still screw you. Yeah. It, it oh, will yeah. move. Yeah. It will move them down because uh, none of us, uh, none of us release daily. Right. And so if you do daily or, or that's another big part yeah. of it. This could and become a, a, an algorithm episode. Really yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get yeah. off of it. But uh, I did want to say I made a mistake on the uh, Burr Williams episode. Cliff corrected me. Cliff is the one who made the bomb target uh, yeah. file. And I had confused that. I, they had it, the disc that it came with. And I found it the other day. Uh, the disk that it came with was a uh, like an Excel file of some coordinates for like two different targets. Cliff yeah. is the one that built that. Yeah. So we're going to have him here to talk about 
some of that. At some Cliff point, is the but. silent cartographer until you don't give him credit for his. Yeah, work. I, I really did. I felt <laughs> bad about it because I mean, then it, it just started burning through my memory, and I go, "Oh yeah, that was Cliff." So. That's Cliff's forte, man. When it comes to analysis and studying satellite data and imagery, I mean, it's what he does. It's part of what he does yeah. for a living. He's an a- expert analyst. So. Um, go ahead. No, you I, didn't, I, didn't have I had to tell. I got a story to tell you guys and everybody else. Uh, so. Uh, we, uh, my wife and I were sailing all last week. We went and dropped our boat in Little Oak Creek. We hadn't been there since it's been full. It's fantastic. Had a great time. And uh, we got down there. We had our dog with us, realized we didn't bring dog food. So we went into town, into Blackwell. I don't think either one of you guys have been there with me when it was open, but there's a little corner store. There's one intersection in that town. Oh, yeah. I've passed little, by it. Yeah, a little yeah. mom and pop, literally a mom and pop place. So we go in there and uh, strike up a conversation, and uh, I found out because the, the lady is the first time somebody says, "So what do you do?" And I said, "I'm a retired cop." That's the first time I've said that to anybody <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. And she said, "Well, you you look young. Why are you retired?" And I told her, "Well, you know, I have a pretty rough case of cancer and and uh, blah blah." And she says, "Oh, my husband does." And so he comes out and we start talking. And this guy was a cop. He's an artist. I don't have his card here. I meant to bring it because I knew I'd forget his name. And one of the episodes that the three of us are working on is all the nuclear missile sites right. around here. Okay, mm-hmm. you know, we're doing the Atlas and the um, Nike missile and all like that. The guy was a sky cop assigned to the Fort Phantom Hill Nike site. Wow. Yeah, oh, so... Man a lot of that stuff just sort of fell into place. That is so, awesome. That is. And he told a really cool story. I'd love to get him in here. Uh, he's an artist. He does, uh, um, uh, it's, it's representative stuff. He does landscapes and country scenes and stuff like that. Really, really neat stuff. In fact, uh, I'm 90% sure the boss that I had that retired had some of his like buffaloes and the, you know, in the meadow kind of thing. Very cool. But he said he was in the 70s when he was working for Odessa PD, they figured out he could draw when somebody robbed a Western Union station. And they came and grabbed him and said, hey, see if you can draw this guy. And he drew the guy and they go, oh, yeah, we know him. And they went out and arrested him. So, <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool little story how that, how that came out. So, yeah. Very cool. I thought that was neat. But uh, that was part of it. We had a fantastic sale, man. The wind was just banging and, and that is the str- I've, I've sailed a lot of places and that was on our sailing episode just little oak creek in texas man uh it's cool it was it was amazing a buddy of ours uh hooked us up with a, a dock and we stayed in bill's hunting cabin it was too crappy to use the observatory it was yeah it was windy on top of that and then full moon so full moon you know, windy we, and then that front blew in didn't you guys come back a day early because that front blew we in? we left because the front was coming in yeah. we took the yeah. boat out of the water uh we we stayed long we were having a great time uh it was thursday before we could put all of the sails up we were reefed in tight i mean yeah. that boat was in her bra and panties the whole week because it was blowing so hard and uh, we finally got the sails up. We're like, all right, this is cool. We haven't been able to do this all all week. So we sailed under full sail all the way out until uh, – there's some pictures. I'll put them up right here where we were actually sailing at night. I mean, we were yeah. – we had the nav lights and everything burning. Awesome. So we wound up putting the boat together or taking her apart in the dark and uh, spent the night. And it was – we woke up to fall. So <laughs> <laughs> we got out of there. That yep. was nice. So, So – uh, this episode, we brought this up before. We're going to talk about the 1945 crash of a P-38 Lightning in Midland, Texas. Okay, so if I may jump take, in, take the helm on the first comment regarding the main topic of, uh, I guess if you want to call it that, of this podcast. I had heard about this through you and through Cliff and just, you know, it's one of those stories you hear about on and off. You grow up in a place like yeah. this your whole life. But I had never read from beginning to end all of the assembled reports Mm -hmm. and information on that until I started last night and I finished today. And the, I don't don't know what to call it because I don't know if there's a word for it, but the incompetence of not only the, the pilot in this tragedy, 
but the entire system are surrounding him that allowed him to get into the position where this plane crashed is is something that thankfully, hopefully, could never happen again with the, with the evolution of the rules um, under yeah. which pilots fly. I'm with you. I'm going to approach it from a little di- different direction. Uh, having done a lot of these, the the way I had never heard of this ever. Uh, the way we found out, uh, Craig Fuller, Aviation Archaeology, aviationarchaeology.com. We've mentioned him yeah. quite a few times. Um, before they had some internet problems, they had a, a searchable database. And if you couldn't find what you wanted, you just email Craig and he would find it. And just for grins, I searched Midland. Mm-hmm. And I found, that's where I found this. I had no idea it had ever happened. Okay. Because we were still looking for the airplane we found in the Guads from that, that mm-hmm. other episode and ran across this. And World War II, especially when you get to looking at the crashes around, especially Carlsbad, up in the mountains, the bomber training, this really shows uh, how desperate we are were for air power yeah. in those days because yeah, it was, it, compared they, to now, right. there's absolutely no way this, this could have happened right. uh, if, if you're just taking flying lessons in the same airfield. And, we, and by the way, we're, we're less than a mile and a half from that airfield. Right. Less than a mile from that airfield right here. And so, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot to it, and we'll dig in. Yeah. And the, the, so let, just because nobody's going to know what we're talking about, let's talk about exactly what happened okay. and who was involved. Let's start with the airplane, uh, P-38 Lightning. Um, they, P-38 L series. L series, yeah. yeah. You got some. You got some info. I, on I wrote down a couple of notes and just like little questions that I had. Okay. When I was reading these things. Um, a thumbnail of that aircraft. It's the. It's one of my favorites. I was fascinated with it as a kid. Of course, I've forgotten everything and had to look it all back up. Uh, twin engine, twin boom, uh, multi-purpose airplanes. So they were, they were fighters. They were. They're fair fighters. They're interceptors because they were fast. I mean, they could go out and they could catch bombers and things like that. They were used as dive bombers. They were used as high altitude reconnaissance. And reconnaissance, yeah, it was a high altitude. They did low dive bombing stuff and and all that. They, it, it they was did an, a lot of things. It, it was a warplane that was good at a lot of things, but really great at nothing. It's like a, it's like my mo- like the KLR. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Was. Uh, it was is one of the coolest sounding airplanes you'll ever hear. The twin turbocharged. Uh, the just because of the the speed that the engines run, the way that they run with the superchargers and the counter-rotating props, giant three-bladed props. They mm-hmm. sounded so cool, you know, and dragging all that aluminum through the sky. Uh, I believe they were 1941 through uh, 47. We started dumping them off to other countries, something yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, somewhere in there. Sounds about right. Uh, not a common sight around here, even for the time. And nothing in the report explains why it was here. I, did you did you I, find anything? I wondered about that myself. Um, the only thing that I can figure, just based on what I read, was it was part of a ferrying detachment. Yeah, it was it was being ferried. And, and it was being ferried. Yeah. I think that it probably was what was happening was it uh, it was being ferried. Ended up at at Midland for some reason or another, and I think they brought this pilot in to ferry it the rest of the way or he was he, he was based out of Long Beach. Right. Yep. And so As was his whole unit. Right. So I don't yeah. know if he flew it from there are certain things that are not in the report. So we don't no. know if he ferried it from Long Beach to Midland and then got to Midland and had problems and crashed or if he took possession of the plane at Midland to take right. it somewhere else. And yeah, here's, I was wondering that. Yeah. Yeah, none of this is here's something that that uh I'm a little unclear on maybe you guys reading the report with fresh eyes can it, lay on me or somebody who's watching. It should be said that the, the that he was completely unqualified to fly the airplane and that's why. It Just crashed. yeah, barely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this was the 577th Army Air Force Base Unit at Midland Municipal Airport. Now at the time, Midland Municipal Airport is now Air Park. Right. And but it was a support field for Army Airfield, now, right? You, right. Uh, at some point. Now, here's here's the catch. When I told you guys, hey, 
good luck trying to find any history. Oh, I couldn't. There's no, I couldn't. nothing out there. Yeah, on MDD, there's no, there's yeah. nothing. Yeah. So somebody out there knows. I'd be glad to hear more about it. So we have the big, uh, what's now the International Air and Space Port, which was Midland Army Airfield. And you guys can Google all this stuff. All the locals are pretty familiar with it. It was a bomber base, bomber training. It's part of a network. We've talked about it before. And you have this little airport out here. Now, f for the locals, uh, it used to be larger. That runway that we're going to talk about actually extended into what is now Winlands Park. Yeah. So if you look runway at it. Runway 16. Yeah, 16 went all the way into Winlands Park. And then there was a taxiway that goes back uh, up to the 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 tarmac the ranch yeah you know, for the locals the aprons, Wa wadley go. was not there yeah wadley none of this existed. Yeah, wadley street right so uh why this was there it's not explained it never says where he was going it never says where he came from so uh thumbnail of the crash which we'll get into this happened on uh it was around noon it was around noon yeah, on like july 31st and, yeah 31 I, july 1945 mm -hmm. and uh I noticed in the newspaper uh, that the entire military presence in Midland, Texas, was getting ready for Air Force Day. Interesting. Y yeah, and look up Air Force Day. I, I have. I, I don't, don't know, know what that is. At the time, were, there was not an Air Force. They were expecting three to five thousand people. They were setting up bleachers and pyros and all this other stuff. Huh. I, I just found that today. I went to the Midland County Public uh, Homeless Shelter to pull up the. The library that was a joke uh I, to pull up the newspaper articles and th the newspaper articles were tiny it's like <laughs> a dude died in a plane crash period um so anyway uh 31 july 1945 12 38 so just after noon uh, it was it was first lieutenant thomas b frederick took off in the p-38 runway 16 so that's uh runway still there Runs north and south from Loop 250 to Winlands Park. Uh, he took off, and then about two minutes later, everybody refers to it as a garbled message to the tower. So I'm assuming he is talking to the tower at what is now MAF. Uh, no, now, or did they have a tower here? There may it may have been a tower at airport back then. But I don't know. It was garbled. Towers could be pretty simple back in World War II. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was. Uh, he, 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 he spoke to a tower. It was garbled. He was having engine trouble. Uh, the word oil was mentioned in a couple of the witness statements. No, and I know, and I may be jumping ahead, they talked about a bluish white smoke. Right. right. Is that from the oil? Um, or? Yeah, maybe. Um, I have, it depends on how much oil. Yeah, I've developed a theory on this whole okay. thing. So let, well, yeah. We'll get okay. to it. Uh, so he, here, here's what else is strange about this, uh, in the details of the report. So he's taking off to the South. So he's flying over the town. He's flying over the old golf course, right. uh, what's now the duck pond. You know, he's, mm -hmm. he's taking off that way. Two minutes out and he says, I'm, I'm having problems. And a lot of people notice his right engine is dead and he's trailing that smoke. Mm -hmm. So he turns around and it says he entered the downwind leg. They never explain which way, what was downwind. The only thing that led me to what I concluded was his downwind leg. Uh, for you non-pilots, this is where you fly parallel to the runway before you land right. a certain distance can, away. And, and that's where you'll hear the, the, the tower tell a pilot to ma either make left traffic or right traffic. That's or it's designated. Or it's designated, yeah. yeah but in a procedure, you've got a right hand or a left hand. Right. It's, it's to keep planes from running into each right. other. Imagine Arizona parking lot, right? You know, so um, best I can understand from what I've read, where the plane was seen, it was a left-hand pattern. Okay. So one engine is dead, his right engine is dead, and he enters a downwind. So his left engine is running, and they refer to <coughs> the right engine is right propeller is being feathered. So what that means is the propellers have a variable pitch. So they can scoop more air or less air to keep the engine running at a constant speed and, and propel the airplane at different speeds. When that engine dies, they feather, and so they're, they're pointed uh, along the same plane as the fuselage to reduce the drag. So if you guys and, to, and to keep them from wanting to spin. Yeah, well, and to yeah. keep them from spinning. Uh, if you guys look at the, uh, these uh, wind turbines, 
when you see them on a windy day and there's one not turning, you'll notice the they the blades that, are those blades. flat to the to the to the uh, to the on, yeah to the, to the wind. wind. Yeah. So that was happening, but, and yeah. he so, makes he makes his downwind, and then he makes a couple of fatal mistakes. Right. We'll we'll get to that. So he he's on his downwind. He turns to base leg. This is where he's going to turn left and presumably left and 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 land and he crashes right. and uh again in even in modern or some modern crash reports they aren't really specific about where it happened this one we just got two miles north of the airport and he crashed at a 10 degree angle they estimated and made a bounce which tells me he stalled yeah and was on his way out of the stall so he almost made it yeah. at least into he a really would, if he had had a little more altitude he probably could have pulled out yeah a little more speed yeah. or a little more altitude he he probably could have pulled out so uh when and there are a ton of witnesses i've never seen a report with this many witness statements ever this right. is this is yeah, a it went on and on yeah. and on and on page after page after page of witness statements and uh they all said the same thing and they see the first they say dust and they see the the smoke no, I and was oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you no. off there, but I was but reading. It said that he hit right wing first. Right. Because it was an engine stall. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. was was he angled whenever he's coming? No, down no, he, he was kind of flat. OK. And um, we'll get to that. We'll get to the twin engine and the procedure thing. I wish I had Matt Ruff in here because he's explained this to me so well. Uh, I'm not multi engine rating, so I, I'm qualified qualified to fly with zero or one engine <laughs> <laughs> glider or glider yeah. self-launch that's without, all I have. without retracting landing gear. yeah zero or zero or one engines yeah. so anyway uh he he stalls makes this shallow ditch and here comes the firefighting gear which consists of two trucks with a 300 gallon capacity each mm -hmm. and no fire suits yeah and rescue attempts are made which we're going to get to and uh the pilot's dead and that's it that's the the end of it uh first thing i think we'll talk about is the location uh the i i, I went out there on my motorcycle and i filmed this and and uh the, the audio is crap my i had a setup kind of like yours with the microphone inside my helmet a couple of years ago and i tried to film the area and explain where everything happened and it is such a large area Part of it's owned by an oil company. Part of it, it w has been plowed fields for ages. Mm -hmm. So, right, you know, uh, and, the, and the plane, uh, the investigation indicated this thing just absolutely burned to the ground. And, and you know, so it melted. Yeah. And the, they ran out of water. Yeah. The, the trucks yeah. ran out of water and there was a lot of fuel in the in the airplane. And right. It burnt, and it burned up. And, right. Yeah. And, it was, it was loaded it. For, t for takeoff and it, yeah. and it went. Uh, and we'll get to that because there's a really kind of heartbreaking yeah uh witness statement in here uh so my plan was to go out there and look around maybe run some metal detecting and all that and, and getting permission on any of these places one of them the golf course i wouldn't even bother with that because you know yeah. it's been turned over so much um the cotton field it's being developed for houses now so a lot of it's developed and then the the uh oil field part of it uh I won't say the company name, but I've dealt with them before, and they're not going to let you do anything right. out there. And yeah, the, the liability issues they're dealing with yeah, in this day and so age, they, they don't let anybody do Even anything. if we were granted permission, we're going to find um, nuts and bolts and bits of, of uh, melted aluminum, but we're going to find 10 million beer tabs and nails before we ever get exactly. there. So it's just – it's Kind of there, futile. There was enough there for me to confirm the spot on my – my crash map and that's it so what followed and what's interesting about this and we we'll get to it was the firefighting gear thing yeah so so, yeah. so how this all starts out is that this pilot who is completely unqualified to fly the p-38 it is later discovered can't get the engines started he's out on the line he's out on the flight line trying to start the engines and he can't get them to start it, get them started so a line chief with a taxi ticket i assume goes out and starts the engines for the pilot. So this immediately tells me that he he probably read the manual before he went and got in the plane and tried to start it. 
uh, or maybe this was his second or third time. I have uh, I have his witness statement. Okay, well he he said basically that the pilot had flooded the engines. Yeah. And and didn't have them set up right. So he uh, he starts the engines, gets the engine back into proper configuration at idle, you know, yeah. and and. <laughs> And give basically gets out of the cockpit and lets the pilot get back in the cockpit and gets clear of the airplane and he takes off. I'm gonna let Mike read the critical part of that. I, I've got a I've left a piece uh, piece of paper on my desk. I'm gonna go grab okay. the section here. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Let me get my radio voice going. Yes. On 31 July 1945, about two well 12. 12.30 CWT, I noticed that the pilot of the P-38L 44-53264 was having trouble getting his airplane started. I entered the cockpit and found the engines flooded. I started the aircraft. I ran the engines up to take off RPM. The magnetos, oil temperature, fuel pressure, oil pressure, coolant temperature, RPM, and manifold pressure all checked normal. I throttled the engines down and let the pilot into the cockpit. <laughs> Wow. I did not see the airplane leave the ramp, take off, or crash. Okay. So uh, d he's doing just your, your basic stuff that you that you need to do uh, before you d do a, a takeoff run. And checking the magnetos mm -hmm. is one of those things. Just his pre-flight check, Right. Uh, even modern, a lot of modern airplanes, uh, general aviation airplanes, have, a, have redundant magneto systems. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially, you go through a check, make sure they're both working. If one of them is not working, it's only running on one one magneto, then you don't fly. So as someone who is not a pilot and doesn't have a background in aviation, whenever I hear magneto, I think of X-Men. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, So, but, but suffice it to say that that is a huge red flag right there yep. because the odds, and this goes to my theory, is that, is that that pilot quickly got those engines out of proper configuration. And by the time he was a couple of minutes out, the, engine, the engines were wanting to quit, and one of them did. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of one of those deals where the, th this, w and then, and then he, as he's trying to make a traffic pattern to get back in to the airport, he makes two very fatal and very rudimentary mistakes. One is that he goes to full flaps with only one engine running, mm -hmm. and and he lowers the landing gear at yeah. the same time. So he's and then he tries this really apparently st steep ninety degree. Well, he tries to make a ninety degree turn to get onto the base leg of his approach, and that's when he stalled it out. He he tries to land it as you would land a, a an, normally an running airplane. Yeah. Exactly. Um. In uh, here's the what I was looking for. It's uh. He has 403 uh, hours total time. And then it says 521, uh, the way they, 521 hours, other pilot or other student. So I guess that's so he's got instruction hours, time. Yeah, yeah so, so your student hours, uh, yeah, I guess they delineate. 19 hours. Hours in this type. Three hours and ten minutes. Okay, so he'd probably made one previous yeah. flight. And then a total of uh, in 90 days, yeah, was was four hours, ten minutes. So maybe he was taking the plane out to get used to so it. So it, it could yeah. be. He could be this, you know, this could just be getting, getting yeah. stick time. And um, along the lines of what you said, uh, I read in a couple of places, and they even had it on Wikipedia, that said it was it was forgiving now, this is also a counter rotating prop and one of the things that happens when you uh, lose an engine on a on a twin is now you have a propensity to stall mm -hmm. one direction because you're you know yeah, there's a natural yaw. You have that comes more with pull, the yeah, from from one you side. You have to, to the fight other. the you have to fight the yaw with the controls that puts you in a situation where you can more easily stall. Right. And so uh, it, from all from everything he says, you know, he was dirty. He had flaps down. He had he had thirty degrees of flaps. He had gear down. The airplane could not have and, been more and, dirty. Yeah, it could. Full, full flaps, gear down, running on one engine, trying to make a very sharp ninety degree right. turn onto base. Everything that leads to to right. a, to a, a sing, uh, an engine stall. So he probably yeah. hadn't done much or any in that right. the training in that, and then. Um, there was a, I can't find it now. 
they uh, they recommended in and it's in the it's in the report that the procedure is not to drop the gear until the last until minute. you to are this it says day. until the pilot is sure he's going to make the runway exactly yeah. and that's still the rule to this day yeah you don't and generally you want to you want to be able to try to land uh, with the minimal uh, flap setting. You know, a lot of times, depending on the airframe that we're talking about and the, and the conditions, you may land with no flaps at a higher speed to keep the airplane stable. So it, it suffice it to say we're kind of going into the minutia of this a little bit too much. But the, du- the dude did every single thing wrong. And the this, this is Which not is a testament to him being a moron. It is no. a testament to how fast they were cranking out oh, yeah. pilots and airplanes right. at that time. I had a question about that too, actually, because, um, you know, he, he would have had some training with, with the plane and everything. And, and I was wondering how much would be just your muscle memory and training kicking in, trying to figure out the different, uh, you know, controls, trying to get the landing and how much of it would just be panic that it, you would kind of throw, everything would throw <laughs> off and you would... Here's the thing they they try to, in in modern training um, they it, it's a checklist mm-hmm. okay for example um, and again I'm I'm a sailplane pilot I'm a glider pilot and one of the things they'll do is uh, I don't know what it is for any other airplane but our magic number is 200 feet if you're under tow you know, you're being towed by the tow plane or you're in a self launch you know a collider with a motor on it and you get off the ground you say 200 feet aloud even if there's nobody right. but god in the cockpit with you to hear you you say 200 feet because that changes your procedure if it's less than 200 feet and you have a long runway which where the places i've flown we are, we're blessed with long runways you can shut it down and get on the ground and maybe run off the end if you're lucky Beyond 200 feet, you can turn around. Mm -hmm. You have to turn around and land. And that's just a, it's a, it's a procedure they're trying to build into you. Right. It's like when you you automatically do. It's like when you hear a, uh, when you hear a a pilot and a co-pilot in a commercial airliner call out minimums. A lot of times now the airplane calls out the minimums to you. But it's the same thing. It's because if something goes wrong past this point, your procedure is different than before you're at minimums. Okay. So it's the, it, that's the mm-hmm. basic principle of it. And I'm, I'm getting these mixed up. What was absolutely tragic, and I, I want to give the, the man's name, and I hope I did not mess these up. Um, so so you're two miles, two miles away, and the only support, I believe it's going to be um, – Captain Blunt, I believe it was his. Man, I'm going to get this wrong. Yeah, I know that the one you're going right. to read. Yeah, he's the one who went out there and he said, I couldn't believe when I got there they didn't have asbestos suits for yeah. anybody. Well, is he, the, he one, the one who's the one with the fire axe? That's what I was just about to ask. Was he the one with the fire axe? Yeah, he's the one who actually beat the, the control. Yeah. He, yeah. he beat the instrument panel out so that they could get the pilot free while they were dousing the airplane. Can you imagine being up in the middle of all that, beating the crap out of the instrument I, panel to I get the pilot I printed out the wrong one. That was the one burning. I was looking for. He, he, he noticed, um, the captain, when he got out there, he noticed that the airplane looked like somewhat that. intact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to get his name right, Mike. Thank you very much for looking that up. I'm pretty sure it's Captain Blunt. Um, I think you're right. The nose was broken off. Of the aircraft, and the and it had yanked a bunch of instruments right, out of the panel. Right, so it had taken. Went. So essentially, yeah. uh, so if you imagine you know, you're sitting in a car and your engine is pulled away, and there's just the control panel between you and right. you know the outside, and he got a fire axe and was hacking away at the aluminum until he saw the pilot's feet, feet and yeah. he was getting ready to to get him out of the harness and pull him through pull him through there. Yeah. yeah. And at and that they ran out moment, of they ran out of water. Yeah. And I cannot imagine how many times the guy saw that in his dreams. Yeah, trying um, to get that guy. And almost, like, just almost had him, and they run out of water. Now, by all accounts, the pilot was... And no fire suits. And no fire suits. By all accounts, 
<clears throat> the pilot was dead or unconscious. Yeah. When Most of the, some of the accounts said that they felt like he was probably still alive, but the majority of the eyewitness accounts said that the, he was, he, he looked dead. Yeah. He, but he still, was, you, you want to get him out of there right. in, in either case before his body's, you know, well, burned beyond. The, they were saying too, he looked dead, but that there was still blood. Flowing he was bleeding. From, yeah. He was actively yeah. bleeding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, Lieutenant Vernon E. Grout, G-R-O-U-T, is what I have. Okay. Now, that's the first one. Well, he, this is the one that says that he grabbed the fire axe. Okay. Yeah. He did say, um, okay, I have his. He does say, uh, yeah, no asbestos suits. There he is. Okay, I've got it. Uh, I then took a fire axe. That's right. This is Lieutenant Vernon E. Grout. Um, in his statement says, I noticed that the fireman did not have asbestos suits. I asked, uh, Mr. Fern Davis, the fire chief for an asbestos suit. He informed me that the airfield had removed the suits from the station. Yeah. I then took a fire ax and chopped the two top corners of the instrument panel off with the aid of Lieutenant Woodrow Clemmer, uh, assistant aircraft maintenance officer. I pulled the instrument panel free. The pilot's legs were visible, then accessible, but the safety belt was still fastened. At the same moment the instrument panel was free, both fire trucks ran out of water. Because of the intense heat, no one could get near the airplane. Is this officer's opinion that as best as, had asbestos suits been available, the pilot could have been removed before the trucks exhausted their first load of water? That's that's optimistic probably, mm -hmm. but but, uh, but it's frustrating. But, you know, that's a statement from a guy that was there, and I understand yeah, that. I, I've, right. I've tried to pull, you know, a kid out of a burning car before. I've, I've seen it done, yeah. you know, and I know how that goes. And all of these statements, uh, the many statements, uh, yeah. here's the one. Uh, here's why I'm confused the name. Uh, Captain John W. Blunt, it is my opinion the pilot was still alive yeah. when I arrived mm -hmm. at the scene of the accident. I believe this was because the cut on the pilot's head was, was still bleeding was still when bleeding. I arrived at yeah. the scene. Um, impact occurred uh, approximately three minutes before I arrived at the wreckage. Um, from rough observation, the pilot's head, hair, and body remained in good condition at the time. The supply was exhausted. And the later examination or uh, investigation said he was probably dead, but there is a ton of documentation in this report about the removal of the fire equipment and memos up to July 23rd. Yeah. Do you guys remember that of the correspondence of them fighting about getting the bigger trucks out there? Cause these mm -hmm. trucks, it said, uh, 300 gallon capacity and, uh, they were horrible off road. Yeah. That they slowed down. Yeah. And that thing was full of fuel. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, just taken off, and yeah. I didn't look at the capacity, but I would imagine. Lord, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of it. Um, there's one I wanted to point out. Um, let me find it. He was an aircraft mechanic. He knew he knew he was in trouble. He he, he commented on how it sounded. Uh -huh. You guys remember that one? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Let's see. Um, engineering department. Yeah, sergeant. Milton W. Charno, assigned to Engineering Department, 577 Army Air Force Base Station at Midland Municipal Airport. I'm an aircraft mechanic. Um, you want another beer? Twenty. Yeah, yeah, I'll take one. All right. 21 months experience this guy had. And he says, on 31 July 1945 at about 12, 12.30 Central, I was on my way to Piot, Texas. That's why I wanted to read this. When he was going to the, the Piot Airfield, was driving south on C Street, uh, letter C, that's uh, not far from here. We're on J Street. He was on C Street, which is, uh, he points out, is uh, directly in the path of runway 16, which is, it's close. He saw the uh, aircraft going, and he said, I heard the whine of the turbo on the above-mentioned aircraft. I stopped and looked up and saw where it appeared to, appeared to be blue-white smoke or vapor trailing from the right boom. My first conclusion was that the airplane was siphoning gasoline, but closer observations showed that the smoker vapor was originating too close to the engine to be siphoning gasoline. The airplane started to make a left turn and passed over town. Um, 
both engines were running at the time. The landing gear was in a retracted position. When I saw the airplane, I did not see it crash. I have read the above and true statement of what I saw. That's what, okay, so that gives okay. us the left, left turn. Yeah. And that he dirtied it. He he was setting up for yeah he was setting up setting for a, he was setting up for a normal landing in a in a in a very very compromised aircraft but, so so that it's sad it's really sad the the saddest thing about it is that um, like you said and I hadn't really considered that but at the time that time you know July nineteen forty five uh, this is right before Hiroshima. Yep. You mm -hmm. know, everything's at a fever pitch. They need pilots. And I would imagine, I don't know, this is just speculation on my part, but I would imagine that at this time, if you're a ferry pilot stateside, that means that, and you've got four or 500 hours of total flight time, why wasn't he in combat? Like, right. it makes me wonder, you know, I don't want to insult the guy. I mean, that's not what I'm trying to do. But, you know, we all know that we've all been around, or you and I have been around aviation long enough to know that there are, pilots of varying skill levels yeah. and part of that is staying of being a successful pilot is staying within your talent envelope it's it's part of staying safe too so you know i i have to wonder about the whole f who got picked to be a ferry pilot and or maybe he had done a tour I, I, you know i couldn't i, I couldn't I, find I anything your, saying did he I do totally, a tour and he decided to come back stateside and be a ferry pilot because yeah. he compete he had completed a combat tour. There's no information on any of that, but, but the, the I, I totally get your point. And the other thing the is mista the mistakes that led up to this are so tragic. And I feel so bad, especially at the time for his immediate family, because what a, what a senseless, what a senseless way to go. You know, he, he, he didn't necessarily go because he had a mechanical problem. He went because he was completely unqualified to be in that airplane. Well, and very sad. It, mm -hmm. it, yeah. Yeah, I mean yeah. that that And he's doing three. his he's doing his best for his country and doing his job and you can't fault the guy, but I, I would like to think that something you know, like this couldn't happen. Something today. else. Um one of the qualifications on my license, and again, I I really I know there's probably people who know a lot more about this that are punching your keyboard right now. But uh and and please comment. I I'd, I'd be I'd be happy to hear yeah, answers. yeah. For all the information we have, we're speculating. At a lot three hours, I think I did my transition from glider. Well, added the self-launch rating in about three hours. Mm -hmm. So from the time that I first saw, first got in a pipistrel until the instructor said, "You're ready to go by yourself." I'd have to look at my logbook, but I would be surprised if it was more than three hours mm -hmm. but one of the things you have to do is a cross country in, right. in some cases so this could have been a part could of it but that, i mean that, that doesn't explain but every, everything everything in that documentation says that it was a routine that what they were doing was a routine procedure right so it makes me wonder if he was just trying to get stick time like you said like he's just trying to get out he, i mean he's obviously not going on a on a if it's a if it's routine he wasn't in route from one place to another trying to ferry the airplane from one place to another right maybe he was practicing yeah it, it could have been and, and he could with that much i mean think about some of them that we've we've talked about before they've i mean yeah. they check the boxes and your ferry pilot get this plane to long beach tomorrow somewhere on vhs in my in my I've got a couple of foot lockers from the 80s and 90s full of VHS tapes. And one of them is a, a bunch of interviews with pilots of the 357th fighter group oh, wow. out of yeah. Lashton, yeah. England, including uh, uh, so a couple of very famous uh, uh, pilots, one of which is still alive and in his 90s, the, pi the pilot of Old Crow Bud uh, Eakins, I think it is. And they're talking about how quickly... If if they figured out okay this guy can fly they how quickly they put you in a high performance airplane right <laughs> I mean it was really quick and those guys talked about uh, how they went they they got their first high performance airplanes which were uh, Era Cobras and they sent them out there across Papoose Lake and out there you know across in the Nevada desert and and just let them fly and they gave them you know a couple of weeks to fly that airplane and and take it out to the edge of its performance envelope. And then they sent them overseas, man. Those guys were going into combat with 
it, less than a hundred yeah. hours, I would imagine. Well, and and so I'm not used to the boom again. So <laughs> let's put this into perspective. So, you know, Mike Montalvo gets rich on uh, I don't know drug running or YouTube, whatever. Both they're the both the yeah. same from yeah. both. Or, from a yeah. moral standpoint, they're both equivalent. Right, <laughs> and you say, okay, I, w- I want to buy a P thirty eight, which you can, and you and you score one, you know, on on eBay, and you get a P thirty eight. And I'm, I was running this through my head. You would have to solo. So in the average to solo, was it forty? 40 or 60, well, 40 hours yeah, minimum well, average is 60 hours. Yeah, when I like went that. through general aviation training, it was a 40 hour program. I assume it still is. And I know that when they were training pilots out at Big Spring in the 60s to put them in jets, that the first thing they did to see if those dudes could cut the mustard was they put them in Cessna 172s, which they called T 41s. That yeah. was a military variant. And they put them through a regular old 40 hour VFR training program right and if they made it through that and excelled at it they'd throw them into jets at so that so you're looking at 40 to 60 hours <clears throat> to okay uh in a single engine trainer so back then was uh texan yeah. t6 something yeah. like that the right. I, i'm I, i'm i apologize for my lack of knowledge on this yeah. thing is like gonna be like a t6 and the navy had the volte they were all kind of comparable training weren't here. they still using like pt19s back then yeah yeah so. i don't know about in 1945 if they still were but using PT-19s. a single engine you know single radial engine airplane so anyway to put that into modern perspective you would have to get that you would have to get a multi-engine you would have to get a high performance Oh yeah, and there were and a lot then, of steps. Yeah, yeah, so to do that now, that's that's right. amazing. And the other thing, on the historical standpoint, when you look at the wars since, so you think about, uh, even though we were, you know, Tim and I were kids, but you know, Vietnam, and then into well, let's go back even Korea, Vietnam, uh, and. Uh, into the Gulf Wars and the modern conflicts. It's all on TV. Yeah. This this airplane almost literally flew over my house. <laughs> like like where we're talking it may right have. now. Yeah. It may have flown over uh, this house. Yeah, yeah. We are just uh, I, I'm just a little bit to the west. So in my backyard I can see airplanes leaving approach right. all leaving uh, all the time, leaving departure all the time. Or, or um, yeah, final there, final approach. The, our, so our prevailing was, winds, for those of you who don't know, our prevailing winds here in West Texas are are from the south southwest. So most uh, departing aircraft will take off on 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 a runway one six. Yeah. So I, I yeah. see them, and I, I even know some of the airplanes. I know the who owns them and which ones are rentals and. Mm-hmm. Uh, mainly from you know Cliff's son Austin, he's a mechanic out there. So it's it's just amazing to me that here's a guy driving to work, going to Pyote to another military base is on C Street. Yeah, like you know it's where a buddy of mine lives, you know, just right out there. So how? And uh, I, I mentioned to you guys uh, one of the things I had not done in this. I I kind of my. Uh, in, in terms of the crashes, and you, you'll hear this in other episodes, <clears throat> we're kind of focused on finding the place yeah. that it happened and yeah. absorbing a little of the history. So I'm not into the super technical. I'm not balls on on the history and all that. So once I figured out we're never going to find the, the the site on this, it's mm-hmm. just it's near impossible. I kind of, you know, yeah, let it go. But. Uh, so I didn't think about it until I woke up this morning. I never checked the newspaper and I've gotten a lot of data from the newspaper because they'll put more in it back in, back yeah. when you look into the seventies, eighties, nineties, <laughs> there'll be more in the newspaper about the location than there is in the FAA report. Then you, um, hit, then you hit the jackpot. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Our IM started blowing up with Matt with all these microfish yeah. images. Look what yeah, I found. Look yeah. what I found. So I'm going to put up, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to put up a couple of things. Uh, now, uh, the here are the crash site photos. Uh, this is it, folks. This, these are all the pictures they have. It's amazing that that was restricted 
information. Oh, and it was yeah. such a horrible yeah. photograph. You couldn't. Yeah. You couldn't. No. You couldn't tell heads from tails with those photos. You, man. you, you really can't. Uh, one of these that you're going to see has uh, a little puff of trees in it. And those are normally extremely valuable pieces of information in this part of the country because there aren't many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but nothing fit because they're probably gone. They're probably under, right. again, a golf course or... Yeah. You know, a pump jack yeah, pad things have or changed housing. So much in that part, yeah, of, uh, that part of housing town. development. Um, I'm going to link the video again. The video is crap. You can't really hear me talking over the wind noise and all. But I, I ride a motorcycle out to the location and show you, and it's been plowed over and over and over. Uh, but uh, let's see, where was I going with this? You were talking about the how location. You, yeah, location. Yep. Oh, and then so the newspaper articles normally will have a lot of pictures and all. This is it, folks. What we're showing you here were the pictures. I'm going to show you now the two newspaper articles. <laughs> and uh, this, the, the, you have to understand, uh, the newspaper was full of articles this size about various aspects of the war. What's going on here? What's going on there? Now, bear in mind, no one knew the atomic bomb was coming Right. At this point. In fact, they were still trying to figure out how to use bats to set fire to Tokyo. Yeah. That's a thing, kids, yeah. if you don't know about it. Oh, yeah, it. read about that. That's a lot of fun. <laughs> Look up the bat bombs, yeah. uh, which were moderately successful. They actually had a malfunction where these bats got out with little... Uh, oh, we are talking about bats, the animal, not bats, the baseball tool. Yeah. There you yeah, go. little bats, yeah. <laughs> uh, they strapped thermite to them, put them, cooled them to... Uh, kind of a, a sleepy night night sort of hibernation warmed them up dropped them in special canisters with uh, little thermite bombs strapped to their feet so that they would fly into japan and roost on the wooden structures and then the thermite would go off and set fire to japan and it kind of worked it worked very well yeah. on a military institution i can't remember which one uh it wasn't a test. They escaped or something wrong happened and they burned a bunch of stuff down. They didn't mean to. It's like, hey, it works. And then just suddenly one day they said, hey, um, your money's gone. Everybody go home. Set the bats loose. And they're driving home going, I don't understand. The research was going so, <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, we need to get yeah. out of here. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. we've digressed yeah. big time. So yeah. that's what happened. Well, we, the point is... Uh, the the what the public is seeing you know when you look in these newspapers it was all this information about the war so one guy scratching one p38 outside of a town was nothing so here here are the articles yeah i'm looking at the articles right now and i yeah. think they're two paragraphs and maybe three yeah, sentences it, yeah. and and i'll sum them up the first one says uh, a guy crashed a p38 outside of town they haven't released his name and then the second one says uh, here's his name. Yeah. And that that's was it. it. That's, that's, it. that's all. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, again, if, if you're ever just need something to do, but you have to keep in mind that go. newspapers were a primary form of communication and for the spreading of, uh, of information and news. And there was a lot going on in July of 1945. Oh, yeah. So this was like, yeah, we need to make, we need to, you know, this is a news event. We need to make, some we need to give it a couple inches in the paper this day and this day but otherwise man look at all of this stuff that's happening yep. in the pacific and european theater, oh yeah so. yeah that yeah. was it so right. but uh it, it just that again uh all this is fascinating to me because it was right here literally in yeah. in our backyard it's something so. that mm -hmm. uh, it, it, people don't realize the the, the world war ii history and to this pilot and to his family you know all all do respect all do admiration all all do uh props if you will not to 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 be a little bit punny uh the, this this guy the, those guys got pushed into situations where like you said they needed pilots they needed to get stuff done they didn't always have time to train people properly the guy was doing the best he can and us with aviation experience it's easy for 
for me to to the it's this as I was reading the report and I was like I can't believe that dude went 30 degrees of flaps with only one engine running <laughs> right. why would you do that you know but it's that's easy to do armchair quarterbacking a fatal yeah. situation that's really freaking easy to do so that's not our intention by doing this we basically want to make this podcast just to preserve this it's a piece of history that again we're really good at finding these little pieces of history that have been lost in West Texas well, history. And this is a way of keeping it all. And I'll say another thing you can do really well in your emergency training. Uh, you can, uh, yeah, but nothing you compares can read to a about real it. Emergency. You can simulate it and you know, you wake up that morning going, okay, this is a day I'm practicing rope breaks and you know, you call that 200 feet and the instructor pops it and you have to yeah, turn around. Right. And then there's that day where you're flying along. And when it, when it happened to me, uh, it was above 200 feet. I was in absolutely no danger, but uh, we didn't have radio communication between the pilot, the sailplane pilot and tow pilot, and he rocked his wings, uh, which is the signal for release now. Yeah. Now, get off of the me. The rest of the time, uh, in, in every other time I had ever seen him do that, was they were flying into horrible turbulence which is the rising air that the sailplanes are looking for. So when you see him do that, you're going, oh, yeah, this is going to be a good day. <laughs> and he rocked, and it takes about three or four seconds for you to fly through that same pocket of air. So I was just waiting. I was, I was waiting to hit it and kind of see where it was so I'd know to come back to it. And I went through smooth air, and I thought, I wonder what that's about. And then I just saw the plane. And uh, the and, you know, I, saw his, I could see his prop. Just windmilling. Uh, he was. He he was. He was gonna have to dead stick it. Yeah, he did. He landed on the highway. Everything was fine. The airplane was recovered. Everybody was cool. But uh, I didn't know I was in an emergency situation until he disappeared, and uh, all I knew is he was going down, and I was. That was his problem at the time, and I. You still I gotta pulled fly your airplane. Yeah. yeah. And but the thought of the procedure of what you do: step one, step two, step three. It was nothing but he's crashing. I'm not going with him. So I'm holding the release open with my left hand and flying with my right just to make sure I, I look down. And as, as he turned away from me going down and I could just see his prop going ka-chung, ka-chung, I saw the end of the tow rope and I go, all right, we're cool. And and I, I called it and I saw where he landed and he was cool. And I went back and anyway, we, we, yeah. we got him. But I can tell you the frame of mind was different sure. than the training. And when you talk to guys like like our buddy Matt Ruff, that's seen it and done it, you know, in, in emergency fixed situations, wing, fixed wing, rotor wing, yeah, yeah. So maybe this was a guy that couldn't make that transition, or maybe it was just a guy that was building hours to go over there. Could be, yeah. There's but, there's absolutely but, but no almost, telling. But almost 500 hours is a lot of pilot hours. Yeah, yeah. So you know, yeah, there's there's absolutely no telling. But there, we don't. We, there's so much stuff we d- just will never know about this, and we can only speculate. Uh, but but. I, you know, I think just, you know, putting it in the most positive perspective is the best way to go. I have also been told in the past that guys who couldn't make, uh, and this was, uh, I, I wish the man who told me all this, he's, he's since passed, but uh, there were things that would be uh, exceptions on our license like i can't fly without reading glasses on well i can't fly at all right now because i'm in chemotherapy yeah but uh even if i could i have to fly with reading glasses and all a lot of things uh you should just get an ultralight you do it the yeah, renegade way just like take me, off. man. just take off but there's a lot of things <laughs> a lot of things that would keep me from being a military pilot my eyesight was one of them uh-huh. and at the time um that would just keep you from being a combat pilot so that that uh, voltage dip didn't mess with our podcast. I just it? looked at it and everything's still rolling. Do you yeah, have both cameras are still okay. going too? Yeah, right. it, it that typically only affects the board, but we've got the conditioner over there. Anyway, but, I, so anyway, uh, my point is, uh, it, it could have been something like that. Like we're saying, either way, there's there's absolutely no way to tell anymore. And, and this is, and, and in terms of investigations, this is thorough. But one thing about this report i have never seen uh of of the dozens i've read that went into so much 
but hurt over yeah. right rightfully so over the loss of the firefighting equipment. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That you know, and that's kind of one of those things that makes me wonder if that was a point of contention at the time. Yeah. Like like obviously we were rationing, people were being told to do victory gardens and everything. So there was limited resources. And right. it makes me wonder at the time if firefighting is one of those areas where they were cutting corners. And exactly. The, and the pilots and the aviation guys didn't like it because they knew how necessary it was when the shit jumped off, when something right. went wrong. Right. So, yeah, that's one of the things I considered myself was that it seems like everybody's really, really hypersensitive about the fact that yeah. the, that the uh, firefighting equipment wasn't where it needed to be. It was, was that the hit you got off of it? Yeah. Like, it, it, you know, in, in each of the witness accounts, it, that was always something that was – we didn't have you know asbestos suits, and then the tanks weren't big enough, and right. it was just yeah. the trucks were. And too there were small. only two trucks, yeah. and they only had three hundred gallons each, and blah blah blah. Yeah, exactly. They didn't have enough helmets. One guy took off his helmet, put it on the ground, and I can't remember who it was. The a grout, I think, picked it up, put it on his head, and oh, went into. Oh yeah, 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 and yeah, could be rashing, could be you know, military. I can tell you that's a normal thing, but it, but it fascinated me. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that's happened to me in government service before is you tell them <laughs> this shit's going to happen. And because of A, B, and C, you know, the things that have happened, this is going to go down. And, and then go, it goes, yeah, it'll never happen. And then, it, and happens, then it happens. And then all of your reports, all the communications winds up in a crash report that some guys are reading <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in 2019 yeah. and, and picking over your work. But. Well, uh, I tell you, uh, this uh, the voltage dips have me paranoid. Should we end this? We're one? right about there anyway. Okay. Uh, and those are not because of my air conditioner motor. That's grid power. But we're we're done anyway. So, mm-hmm. gentlemen, thank you. And uh, a fascinating yeah. topic yeah. from West Texas history. And I'm really glad that we're digging back into this stuff to keep yeah. it alive. And 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 keep the memory of these people alive yeah, you know not, not not just the pilot who who unfortunately perished but all the guys who tried and risked their own lives to try to save his their names and their deeds deserve to be remembered. there are the two names uh i really want everybody here uh lieutenant vernon e grout with his fire axe and uh there's an illustration for you mike Don't there you go it. and uh First Lieutenant uh, Thomas Frederick, Thomas B. Frederick, who lost his life in this U.S. Army Air Corps. Rest in peace. Thank Rest you in for peace, your service. sir. Mm-hmm. All right, gentlemen. All right. Good times. Thank you. Yeah. Had to stretch for that one. <laughs> we'll get the hang of it.